It is Friday, and that means lore. It is also a Horus Heresy day, which means multi-part lore. It also usually means that since the Horus Heresy lore breakdown videos are of sufficient length, that I put an advertisement in the middle. But not today, instead we're going to try something different and see how you guys respond to it. Because for this video I have actually accepted a sponsorship deal from the Magnet Baron to show off some 40k related goods. I have for a while now argued that YouTubers probably should be looking for other ways to monetize their content on YouTube because, well, YouTube is YouTube, and that in and of itself can be a somewhat interesting position to find oneself in. But I've also always been a little bit hesitant to sponsorship deals, but in this case, this is a product I see no problems endorsing, and even more importantly, at no point has the Magnet Baron given me any pre-prepared script of marketing talking points or required me to say anything in particular. And that of course gives me the freedom to tell you about the product in my own words. And then, you can judge for yourself. If you have any thoughts or ideas on this, please do let me know in the comments below. Now, without further ado, let us have a look at today's focused product. An extra large posable magnetic flight stand, shown here with a storm talon in the colours of the Space Wolves. Which is certainly thematic, considering the topic of today's video will include a lot of Space Wolves, and probably quite a few things that fly and shoot as well. And on that note, the kit also works well with the Tyranid Harpy and the Chaos Heldrake. As for why you would want to purchase such a magnetic stand, well, the reasons are almost too obvious, aren't they? Whilst the Storm Talon does come with a plastic base straight from the Games Workshop, they are hardly flexible, are they? And a massive pain in the ass to transport. And virtually requires you to bring along some superglue as well to fix the inevitable mishaps. With this magnetic flight stand, however, you have the two pieces, the stand itself and the base, both of which are magnetized. So that you can simply just place the flight stand on the base and it'll stick there. When you then need to transport it again, just take it off and you can pack it flat, avoiding the risk of having pieces break in mid transport. Additionally, the pausable kit has a magnetic ball and socket joint at the top to allow you to pose your models all dramatic and cool-like, which is of course a great advantage. Models that look cool always roll better. It's simply a rule. And of course, that's not the end of it. Magnet Baron also has further flight stands, for example for Age of Sigma. They've got movement trays and a wide variety of terrain as well. So. If you are ever interested in some magnetized kits for 40k, Age of Sigma, or indeed some terrain, I definitely suggest you give it a look. Link will be in the description down below. And now, on with today's law. Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Horus Heresy lore breakdown, this time on Book 15, Prospero Burns. Uh, a cute and cuddly little creature at a mere 444 pages, and subject material a little bit less dense than the previous one, so hopefully this shouldn't be another six-parter. Though, maybe it should be as well, because this is a pretty damn good book. Hell, Anything that Dan Abnett makes is pretty universally good. This one does have a couple of oddities, shall we say, but overall it's really solid and it gives us the reverse perspective of the Space Wolves versus the Thousand Suns, and it manages to represent both sides fairly well. The Thousand Sons view the Space Wolves as nothing more than savage barbarians, as hypocrites, denouncing the Thousand Sons for using the warp while still allowing their own seers to do so. And throughout the Thousand Sons, the Space Wolves are presented like a force of nature, like an inevitable consequence, like an avalanche coming down upon them, called down by Magnus' own hubris, but still also presented as an unknowing foe, an unreasonable foe. As if the Space Wolves were just there purely to be the Punishers and the Executioners. The beauty of course with Prospero Burns is, we are given a different view of that force. 
It fleshes out the Space Wars and gives us an idea of why they acted as they did. And of course the final outcome of this is that both the Thousand Suns and the Space Wolves come across as much more fleshed out, sympathetic, and understandable. I also love how Abnett goes about detailing and describing the lives of the mortals on Fenris, the planet itself, how it's ever shifting, how the lands rise from the sea and then eventually disappear back beneath it. And the way everything is described, the locals have their own vocabulary, basically. A war is the murder make. Uh, going out to hunt for solid land is described as land thirst, and so on. It's really cool and adds a great little dimension to the book. One thing, however, that I do have a problem with is the phrase, there are no wolves on Fenris. Partially because it is repeated over and over and over and over again, and partially because it is presented as some great witticism, some great insight, a piece of considerable wisdom that you're meant to look at and go like, oh, very deep. But the problem is, it doesn't actually mean anything. Which is why you have a solid 70, 80 different interpretations of what it means. The Thousand Suns seems to mean it in the regards of there are no wolves on Fenris, for wolves are proud, independent creatures. There are only dogs on Fenris. The Space Wolves are like, yes, there are no wolves on Fenris, only heavily mutated, batshit insane Space Wolves. Whilst yet other interpretations, and indeed canon ones as well from other novels, suggest that the original population of Fenris combined their DNA with those of wolves to give them a better chance of surviving on Fenris. In short, it's a phrase that can mean anything and absolutely nothing at the very same time. And I'm fairly sure that was by design as well, so I'm not going to be commenting over much on it because there isn't an answer, really. Another mystery that will actually receive an answer at the end, however, is that of our main character, Rusta, a mortal that decided to go to Fenris for reasons he himself does not quite understand, and occasionally his music. Now, this whole mystery, we'll talk about it when it actually gets, you know, revealed after a while, but I do like this. It's a nice little touch to the entire book. In the first Heretic, I kept complaining about how certain events were not explained. We were simply expected to accept that this happened because reasons. In this book, however, Prospero Burns, we see how a mystery is supposed to be done. Where all of those little hints, those little details that seemed insignificant or mystical all come together to form a whole. And it makes the entire mystery so, so much more satisfying. Because it has a root. It has a wellspring. It exists because of a reason rather than because the author wanted there to be something like that. At the moment, early on in the book, all we know about the mystery is that our main character decided to go to Fenris. He doesn't quite know why, in fact he's scared shitless of wolves and so he would never go to Fenris, but he kind of justifies it to himself that he's trying to overcome his fears. Which sounds reasonable enough, until when he is fleeing because a bunch of space vikings want to kill his ass for being a bad omen, he admits that he hasn't actually studied Fenris. He knows nothing about Fenris. Hell, it appears as if he didn't even know that Fenris was called, which is a pretty damn severe oversight, and has made no preparations really for his trip to Fenris. And then there's the very overt mention of a clavier playing, and he thinks that he should know the reason why, but he can't quite think of it. Hmm. Mystical indeed. Oh, and by the way, I know I've already praised the author for this, describing the world and really adding a sense of life to it, but I gotta do so one more time. The description of the Askamani being attacked by the Bolt because of the evil omen, the main character, the 
Uplander, as he's now referred to, is really cool. Because this is totally how this world would work. A star, an evil star, an escape pod in this case, falls to the Earth, right into Askamani territory. The Askamani have no choice but to take him in because you can't avoid an omen. Whether it be ill or good, you can't simply close your eyes and hope it'll disappear. The Bolt, meanwhile, are scared fucking shitless because to them, this might very well be Satan himself descending from the heavens, and so they go off to eradicate the Askamani. I really love this. It's, it's a believable, genuine and interesting explanation to the conflict we have, and what leads to a high speed... Uh, what do we call it? Sled race of sorts across the ice? <laughs> Which is really cool, although I will point out one thing. No fucking way whatsoever a man manages to control a boat-sized object on runners in strong wind. Fuck no. I don't care how strong, how experienced this dude is, because it's not a question of the steersman. If you have a boat at high speeds, driven by wind, skating across the ice, and with the wind described in the book, the wind will sweep right underneath that boat and start lifting it up. And if by some miracle this doesn't flip the entire thing immediately, it will make it impossible to steer, as it will be lifting the runners, the rear, and the fore randomly, intermittently, with absolutely no bloody warning whatsoever. This thing would be kindling in minutes, tops. And that's being optimistic. But we are digressing slightly from the point. Let us return now to Terra, and quite a few years before Fenris, in fact, because we get a very interesting little view into Terra's um, post-unification history. Although, as we are told, unification is a bit more of a complicated matter than one might at first think. Unification was announced when there were no nations left on Terra that could have any real hope of resisting the Imperium and the Emperor. In all due essentiality, all of the wars were over, because anyone who even attempted to resist at this point would be no more than a temporary speed bump. And yet, the Emperor had made considerable efforts to ensure that those stubborn few who remained would integrate into the Imperium as peacefully as possible. And the example we are given here is of a little nation called Boeotia. They had not been conquered by the Imperium during the Unification Wars, and there was nothing particularly objectionable about them, as the book mentions they were not tyrants or oppressors or unusually cruel in any real way, shape or form, they were simply an ancient lineage that did not want to surrender their hereditary power. It would hardly be the first case in human history where a outdated and de facto irrelevant political power clung on to any shred of influence far beyond what anyone would consider to be reasonable. The Emperor gave them a century and a half to come to terms with the fact that they would no longer be allowed to do as they pleased. As various diplomatic efforts were going on, the Boeotians, however, got a little bit too comfortable. I guess that's the problem with giving them a century and a half of leeway. If you keep coddling them and going like, oh yeah, sure, we'll play along, yeah, yeah, diplomatic niceties, yada, 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 for 150 years, then they might actually start thinking that they can keep this going for all eternity. But as the book mentions, whilst the Imperium and the Emperor are clearly exceptionally patient, that patience does have a limit, and when it was finally reached, the nation was reduced to rubble by the Imperial Army and the Astartes, followed in, interestingly enough, by an equally large army of architects, aid workers, hospital workers, preservers, and scientists. The territory would first be annexed into the Imperium, and that would require military force, overwhelming military force, to ensure that any other nations trying the same tactic 
would not get the wrong idea. But at the same time, the moment the territory was annexed, it was to be restored to full functionality as quickly as possible. The Imperium does not like to waste resources after all, and with the Imperium as the absolute undisputed hegemon, there was no reason to make an example of the civilian populace as well. But there may be another reason too, why the Imperium chose to finally put an end to this little nation. A group of observers stumble across a tomb, inside of which they find statues guarding something, which they have determined because of the runes carved upon them. Something valuable. Then, Imperial Army soldiers shows up, swiftly followed by the Thousand Sons, who tell them that the place is no longer safe, and that they must leave. All permissions have been rescinded, and the area is being cleared. When the Reclaimers finally get permission to enter the area again, there is no sign that there was even a tomb there to begin with. Clearly, whatever the statues were guarding were of interest to more than historians. We also hear the name Caspar Hauser, which one of the Thousand Sons immediately reacts to, asking the man who presented himself as Caspar Hauser whether or not that was supposed to be some kind of joke. This is a fucking obscure reference, <laughs> to put it mildly. So, Caspar Hauser is a reference from the early 1800s. He was a German, or Bavarian, I suppose would be technically more correct, at least in some respects, who claimed to have been raised entirely in complete isolation in a tiny little dark cell for pretty much his entire life, until he arrived in public society and caused quite a stir. Some even suggesting that he might be of Bavarian royal lineage, a princeling hidden away from society so as to avoid embarrassment. But what does any of this have to do with this book, you may ask, because I sure as hell was asking myself that question for quite some time. Now, I happen to know about Caspar Hauser because, well, <laughs> let's just say that when I was learning some basic German in school, when I was like, oh god, like 1514, it's been a while, my German teacher had a peculiar interest for the more esoterical parts of German history, particularly the southern areas of Germany, let's just say. And he brought up Caspar Hauser as a part of the lesson, so I knew who Caspar Hauser was. Even then, it took me quite a while to get the reference, because again, this was a very long time ago. But I was like, okay, so Caspar Hauser. What the hell does that have to do with anything? The fact that he was a habitual liar, and the fact that the Thousand Sons have uh, worked some lying magic of their very own on our subject here, that could potentially be it. The whole thing is a lie, therefore Caspar Hauser, right? Okay, that sounds reasonable enough, and I do believe that is probably an aspect of it, but there is an additional little thing here as well. Caspar Hauser is what we would call a wolf child. Uh, suddenly the pieces are starting to fit together quite nicely, with the idea of a wolf child being somebody raised away from human contact. The most classical example is, you know, children raised by animals, but wolves in particular. Now, of course, Caspar Hauser was not raised by wolves, but according to his own story, he was raised in complete isolation from other humans, until he became a fair bit older, and his only human contact then was with a man who wore a peculiar mask, who taught him a few words, a sentence here and there, and some basic concepts of everyday life. And now, things are starting to make a lot more sense. The Thousand Sons are an extraordinarily well-read legion. They take a great amount of pride in that, in their wisdom, in their broad areas of expertise and study, and 
pre-unification literature, it would almost certainly be one of the fields that they would take great delight in studying so that they could browbeat other legions with, oh, you don't know something so obvious <laughs> as an 1800s obscure Bavarian. <laughs> Basically. And so when Kaspar Hauser introduced himself to the Thousand Sun, he is introducing himself as, hello, I am a lie, an enigma, a falsehood, and a wolf child. And now you can see why the Thousand Sun would react so strongly to this name. Although even then, I'm not sure if that's all of it. I mean, this is some deep lore right here, but the most salient points I could gather from this is a mystery whether or not he truly was raised in complete isolation, a lie in that he probably wasn't, and the enigma of then why would he concoct this particular story, and how did he come about actually, well, coming up with it? And finally, of course, the wolf child part. Now, a legion like the Thousand Sons, who are famous for reading way too much into some things and way too little into others, could have quite the field day with that. But let us move on from 1800s Bavaria, the last place I'd ever expect to find myself in a 40k novel, and back to Ibn Rusta, who has gone through quite the little battle here alongside his newfound protectors. They've been fleeing from a lot of other space vikings who'd want to beat the shit out of them because Ibn Rusta is a bad omen. They are eventually saved by a space wolf, who had, well, you know, um, inconvenience to Rusta in the first place by shooting him down. <laughs> well, I mean, at least he came for him, so, you know, fair's fair, I suppose. Um, and this is no ordinary space wolf either. Ibn's automatic translator hears his name and says, Bear. And so Ibn asks, your name is Bear? And he simply just shrugs, because plot point, <laughs> because he's a space wolf. Now in my case, this one I leapt upon instantly, unlike that other ridiculously vague reference. Because bear, in proper speak, is Björn. Meaning that this is Björn the Fellhanded, the oldest living space wolf, currently interned within the Dreadnought in modern 40k. And this whole point about his name is also going to be rather important later on. And speaking of important, our main character recalls a conversation he had with an official on Terra about an idea he had for historical cataloguing of a bit of a different sort. And speaking of, what should we call this damn dude who has too many names? Let's just stick with Eben, shall we? Because that's relatively simple. So, his idea was that instead of seeking out cataloging and rediscovering the knowledge, which there's already tons of people doing, he wants to create a program to try and figure out what it is we have forgotten in the first place. Let me try and explain this in a somewhat more easy to understand fashion. We have A. We know that A exists, but we do not know how we made A in the first place. Therefore, there must be something that we have forgotten, be it a tool or a piece of knowledge, this being B. And if we know that we are missing B, then we can look at what we are missing to construct A, and therefore make a logical inference about what B is. To put this in a bit of more simplistic example, we know that we've hammered a nail into a board, but we don't know what a hammer is, but we do know that the nail got into the board. Therefore, we know that there is a thing that can hammer nails into boards. And now that we know the problem exists, and what precisely the problem is, we can then begin to infer what we are going to need to solve that problem, e.g. a hammer. It's a really interesting idea, because the character does bring up some good points, like, do we know why the Dark Age happened? Do we know why we fell from grace? Do we know why we're missing these pieces of technology? Do we even know what we lost during a terrorist attack where a lot of data was wiped out? We don't. 
and we need to try and begin figuring out what we have lost so that we can regain that knowledge. Which is far from an unreasonable idea, in fact it's a pretty damn good idea for the Imperium constantly in search of knowledge. However, this is not the job of a historian. This is a job that would require dozens upon dozens, if not hundreds of experts in their fields to locate the holes in our knowledge and then begin to define them. Because all a historian could tell you is, okay, we once knew how to build really tall towers, now we've forgotten that. Okay, that doesn't help anybody whatsoever. Everybody knows that, okay, we used to be able to build them this tall, now we can only build them this tall. Alright, and? There's got to be something more than that. Cataloging that information is utterly worthless. So what I'm assuming he's suggesting is kind of a reverse engineering project starting with the problem. And so again, it doesn't really make sense for him in his current capacity as a de facto historian to really be suggesting this because it is so far beyond his remit that it's, well, faintly ridiculous. And actually, I kind of understand the dude he's talking to. He's clearly been written to be kind of like, oh, fish, like, oh, I had never thought of this. But in reality, <laughs> he actually has a point when he's sitting there with this historian going like, well, that's ridiculous. We already know the technology we've lost, we just don't know what that technology is. So what could you cataloging the things we have forgotten without actually coming up with the actual thing we have forgotten help anyone? And this got remarkably complicated all of a sudden. Moving on with the story. Ruster wakes up inside of the Fang, the mountain home of the Space Wolves, or the Vlaka Fenrika, as they call themselves, but frankly that is too derpy a name, so we're gonna stick with Space Wolves. Which, when you come to think of it, is also a pretty damn derpy name. The Space Wolves. But, you know, it's 40k and it sounds better in the context. The Space Wolves have remade him because, well, he was basically dead slash dying when he got brought to the Fang. His condition was not exactly helped either by the fact that uh, Bjorn decided to rip one of his eyes out. Granted, it was a mechanical eye and therefore installed with all man's spyware and such nonsense, but nevertheless a bit harsh. But of course the Space Wolves wouldn't take anything away without giving it back in some way or form, and so they have remade Eben's body. I'm pretty sure I just called them Rooster at least once in the previous paragraph, and I'm probably going to make that mistake repeatedly, so Eben, Rooster, much the same thing. They have remade him to quite a degree as well, not just giving him another eye, an eye able to see in the pitch darkness, but also a superhuman body, allowing him with no combat expertise whatsoever to fight off a gaggle of presumably, well, nurses, basically, who were taking care of him, and then accidentally let him slip. Accidentally. And we are now also introduced to a wide array of other Space Wolf characters. And again, I really, I just gotta take a moment here. I love how the Space Wolves are portrayed in this book. It's not my favorite. That is still the Space Wolf series with Ragnar Blackmane. Because he basically portrays the Space Wolves as semi-professional hooligans <laughs> with a fair bit of Viking spice to them. They're incredibly casual, incredibly funny, and just an all-around awesome legion. This definitely draws a lot of inspiration from that, but adds in a touch of old-timey professionalism, almost. Just, just a hint, mind you, just a hint. They're still very clearly the Space Wolves, and they act very much so like the Space Wolves would. In the way in which they speak, the way in which they act, the way in which they make themselves known very clearly. They don't dance around the subject. If something annoys them, they say flat out that it annoys them. And they treat even 
with almost like he's a little bit of a retard because he doesn't do this he doesn't treat everything as bluntly and easily as they do and so they think he's a little bit you know simple-minded and they also immediately treat him with a degree of levity you know they joke with him they introduce him into their brotherhood very quickly and as we will learn later that is kind of part of the wider plan but space wolves are really well done because they come across as immediately different and distinct to basically every other legion. Ah, I do love it because God knows Space Wolves can be done wrong as well. Ah, fucking Thunderwolves. Anywho, let's not get into that here. The Space Wolves have another little bombshell to drop on Ibn. He has been sleeping in the Fang for 19 years. And very specifically, they have been keeping him there for 19 years. It didn't take 19 years to fix him, they've just been keeping him around for a bit. For their own unspecified, at the moment at least, reasons. Uh, additionally, the Space Wolf also forgot to mention, although Eben is smart enough to point it out, that this is of course 19 great years. Space Wolf years. So, closer to 50 odd, really then. And only about half a year of that time was spent actually fixing him. Although one interesting thing. In addition to his physical changes, Eben also speaks various languages that he could not speak before. Yuvik and Wolfen, the battle chants and heart chants of the Space Wolves. And yet the wolf priests who mended him insist that they did nothing to his mind. And when he then asks them how he can speak these languages now, they simply won't answer. And as for what they're going to do with him, he is led to a congregation of Tra, the company of which he is currently the guest, for them to decide. And apparently, the last leader of Tra decided that it would be fun to have a skull around to recount their stories. This was what had finally given him permission to go down to Fenris in the first place after being refused some thousand odd times. It was also during this trip down to Fenris that Bjorn decided to shoot him down because, well, apparently nobody told him. And they also mention what finally got him permission. He signed the letter Ahmed ibn Rustar, which is the third name this godforsaken character has at this point, not confusing at bloody all. And I'm kind of ashamed of myself for not noticing this one earlier, but a little bell started ringing in my head when they mentioned that the previous Lord of Tra had a romantic soul, and that the name had something to do with a great explorer and tale teller of ancient terror. And that, finally, was what managed to get me to connect the dots. Ahmed ibn Rusta Isfahani is a character from our own history, but as you noticed, he's got one extra name, and the pronunciation of that name compared to the book, which is Ahmed ibn Rusta, that was what was throwing me off. Now, Ahmed ibn Rusta was an explorer from the Arab world who travelled, well, much of Europe, uh, Persia, uh, Russia, all manners of places, and he wrote a book about it, a kind of amusing one in cases. Um, one of my favourite things from it, I believe, by the way, he also described Europeans as filthy barbarians who only bathed like once a year and stuff. He was most definitively a, uh, a product of his age, shall we say, when the Muslim world was in ascendance and Europe was uh, rather backwater. But one of my favourite stories from it is when he was travelling through the Caucasus and he supposedly met a king there who prayed with Muslims one day, with Jews on another day, and on the Christians on a third day. Because in his own words, since they all claim to have the one true faith, I have decided to make sure that whoever's right, I'm getting into heaven. <laughs> which I really adored. It's like, well, you know, might as well worship all the gods so as to make sure not to offend anyone. A very 
sensible philosophy as far as I'm concerned, anywho. And speaking of faith, we get another little snippet of a conversation between Eben and another conservator, which I find rather interesting as they begin discussing faith. He mentions that it is very difficult to keep faith in any of the old gods, who never bothered to prove their own existence, now that there is a god who has most clearly demonstrated his own divinity, speaking of course of the Emperor. He also mentions that the Emperor has denied every single attempt to title him as such, actively as well, bringing yet another lie to Lorgar stating that oh no no no, daddy never told me that he wouldn't want to be worshipped, but uh, never mind fucking Lorgar. The interesting part here though is he also mentions that along with the rise of the Emperor, virtually all of the other religions also just dried up and started disappearing. Now in part I'm sure this is due to the fact that the Emperor himself has a somewhat combative relationship with organized religion, but there is also definitively a point here. Regardless of how much the Emperor may deny being divine, if you have a person so incredibly powerful, such a unifying force, someone so universally beloved, yeah, it's not much of a stretch to imagine that people who used to place their faith in, you know, magical sky people might instead say, you know what, this isn't a magical sky person, but he seems to tick all the right boxes. I think I'm going to believe in him instead. And this leads on to another point about religion. They claim that what we have forgotten about religion is what it offered us. Mystery. Something to have faith in, and something that essentially conditioned us to believe that certain things did not need to be explained, that you simply had to take them on faith, and that this in and of itself was valuable. It also mentions that the religions have certain mentions of um, taboo knowledge, things that humanity would simply be better off not knowing, wrapped up into the mystery. The point clearly being that religion may have been a defense against chaos, but frankly, <laughs> I find that notion to be vaguely insane. <laughs> Like, oh yes, the Chaos Gods, feed of organized worship, and they're incredibly good at creating facades for themselves and infiltrating organized worship, which is why they encourage it everywhere they go, and yet supposedly it is going to be a defense against it because it outlaws certain knowledge. Yeah, no, you can do that perfectly well with just regular laws and regulations as the imperial truth very clearly demonstrates. In fact, the spread of the imperial truth has pushed the chaos gods to damn near extinction. I find it very disturbing, honestly, how the books, uh, the first heretic in particular, tries repeatedly to justify religion by simply just stating things. The, the last church in particular is oh so guilty of this it's not even funny, where repeatedly we are simply just asked to accept that well this person has faith and fuck you if you question it. Which is a ludicrous argument, it's like well I've stated a thing, don't you dare doubt it. Ah, it's so <laughs> fucking, I how do I even put it? It's basic bitch retardation isn't it? If somebody has faith, okay. I don't mind, I am entirely happy to respect somebody else's faith, and I don't think we should intrude upon that, providing that it is not directly harmful to society, which it can be in some of its more <coughs> extreme forms, but neither do I think that we should ever teach anyone that merely just stating something and going well you can't argue against that because I believe it is an acceptable thing, because it isn't. It's perfectly fine to have faith, but when you start passing off that faith as a factual, indisputable conclusion, that's when we start having some real issues. But moving on from the faith-based arguments, we get to see our first combat action with the Space Wolves, um, fighting against the Quietude. They consider themselves to be the true heirs to humanity's empire and they consider the Terrans to be crude mock-ups, some 
mischievous or indeed malicious attempt by an alien species to create what they thought might pass for humanity, to trick the quietude, as they were apparently quite famous in their area of space as great warriors. Unfortunately, the quietude have um, a rather different view on humanity than Terra had. They appear to have once been human, but at this point they have turned themselves into essentially cyborgs, with a fair bit of alien DNA mixed into the process for, uh, you know, good measure. They also have an extraordinarily hierarchical and fixed society, where a person's role within that society is determined immediately upon birth, and the person is then genetically and biologically altered, along with various mechanical implants to better suit that role, be it a warrior, a clerk, or whatever else. They are also a very advanced civilization, as you'd probably expect from a civilization that focuses all of its efforts in such a specific fashion, and they have weapons, like all enemies the Imperium seems to encounter, more than able to uh, knock out Astarte's power armor, because oddly enough the Imperium always seems to run into nations that can fight them. <laughs> I mean, I know why, it's, it's for storytelling purposes, but just once I would like for the Astartes to arrive at a place where they're like, yes, they're fighting us with sticks and stones, sir. A bit, a bit too simple, really. <laughs> I mean, there has been a couple mentions of that. I, uh, there was a mention in um, one of the earlier books with the um, Lunar Wolves, I believe, and they were still called that, when they described a compliance action against a nation whose ideas of combat were highly ritualistic. They'd set themselves up on what was essentially a soccer field, and then fully expecting the Imperials to do the exact same, just waited for them there. <laughs> the Imperials, although there were loud voices within the Legion urging that they should go down and fight them fairly, eventually decided to just orbital bombard the entire thing, so, you know, that's one example, I suppose. But, in this, something rather odd happens. The Space Wolves, after ambushing a group of their soldiers, use the aliens' weapons against them. Now, technically speaking, these aren't aliens in the strictest definition of the term, they were once human, and so one could argue that their weapons are not necessarily Xeno's tech, but for Imperial servants, and Astartes in particular, to utilize the weapons of the enemy, of the impure, the non-human, is rather interesting. I don't know whether or not I should interpret this as a sign of extreme pragmatism on behalf of the Space Wolves, or as a bit of a derp on the author's part. I don't really know. It seems to bring up a point though, which is a kind of a dumb one. So apparently, the warrior breed of this uh, race is so advanced that they have force fields. These force fields are able to adapt to the kind of damage that it is taking. And so, when the Space Wolves arrive and steal their weapons from them and turn them upon them, their force fields within seconds adapt to cancel out those weapons. The book mentions specifically heat beamers. But they also have access to what is essentially miniaturized mass driver technology. And once they develop their force fields, the Space Wolves then drop the heat beamers and start firing their bolters at them. Which sounds all clever like, oh yes, the moment they adapted, we did something else. Except, if they're really that adaptive, why aren't they coming up with a response to the bolters? It feels like it was just added in there because, you know, um, the quietude, they're scientific and shit, and they can do this, except they can't deal with this. For reasons. And hey, I mean, at least they understand the very same reasons, since they've also invented miniaturized mass driver tech, which also, I assume, makes a complete mockery of their adaptive shield. Bullshit. What was the point of this again? <laughs> Except I guess to tell us that they could do it, I suppose. Now, there is also a more logical explanation, that's the simple fact that I don't care how adaptive your technology is, your defensive abilities, there simply isn't a quick and easy to adopt solution to massive amounts of kinetic energy. 
simply just layering on more armor plating is not going to be particularly practical. And dissipating the energy, well that's also entirely reliant upon the sheer amount of kinetic energy coming at you in the first place. And a bolter, well, good luck dissipating that I suppose. And that really is the beauty of the bolt gun though, isn't it? I do love the design philosophy of whoever came up with the bolt gun as the weapon of the future. No bullshit lasers or plasma guns or heat beamers or fancy pants gravetic launchers, no no no. Just a really really big fucking gun. Because the simple fact is, the technology might be primitive, sure, but it's still brutally effective. And speaking of primitive, yet brutally effective, the leader of Tra, the lord of this particular great company, has a display that he wishes even to watch. He puts the various Imperial Army commanders currently pursuing this war in their place in a less than diplomatic fashion. He essentially humiliates them browbeats them and tells them precisely what he thinks of them. Then he goes on to demand the full authority of the campaign, threatening to not lift so much the finger if he doesn't get it, and the moment they hand it over, he tells them to get fucked. Apparently, diplomacy is not the wolf's strong suit. And the point of showing this to Eben is that he wished to demonstrate that the wolves did things by the book in demanding full battlefield authority and then telling the rest of the Imperial Army that they should fuck off ever so prettily and let his wolves deal with the quietude. And well, whilst that may be correct, the way he went about this was probably the least cooperative thing he could possibly ever have done, and frankly, it's small wonder that Eben is pulled aside later and told a story about how the Imperial Army does not view the wolves with a great deal of love or even honestly really respect. They understand that they are consummate killers, but they also view them as consummate killers that will do anything to win and that anything they view as quite dishonourable. In the commander's own words, they felt almost as if by calling in the wolves they had dishonoured themselves, as if they had stooped to do anything just to win. And as they tell Eben afterwards, this is at the very least partially a deliberate strategy on behalf of the space wolves. As the leader said, it takes a great deal of self-control to be this dangerous. And at first, this is a little bit difficult to unravel. How does this help the space wolves, making an enemy out of the Imperial Army and reducing themselves to de facto outcasts almost, as if they are a lesser part of the Imperium's military might, as if they cannot be entirely trusted, and indeed that they are actively antagonizing the rest of the Imperium's military. How does this benefit the wolves? Well, in a way it does not, in obvious fashion, this does not earn them any friends. But on the other hand, what I think the Lord's intention was to say we are the space wolves. We are dangerous, we are unpredictable, we are downright feral, and we should only be called upon in the most extreme of circumstances. And yet, to Eben he also says, but we act within the rules. It requires a great deal of self-control to be this dangerous, as if he is suggesting to Eben that in reality, they are putting on a bit of a show, and that a lot of their behaviour is a very carefully put together image. And this would certainly make sense to a degree based upon what we will learn from Russ later, although I do think that this noble savage thing is a bit overstated in this book because the rank and file of the Space Wolves are, clearly, what we would refer to as somewhat barbaric. There is a lot of ritual, a lot of tribal belief inherent within the Space Wolves. 
This is also very clearly shown in how they refuse to accept that their magic is magic, their psychic powers. They refer to themselves instead as rune priests, and very clearly delineate between that power and the power of the Thousand Suns, which is certainly to a degree hypocritical. Whilst it might also be possible, of course, that this is simply just a thing amongst the higher ups of the Legion. Once you hit a certain rank within the Legion, Lehman Ross will pull you aside and go, listen, okay? We have a certain image within the Imperium, which I have gone to great lengths to cultivate, and which we need to make sure to maintain. We must be viewed as symbols of fear, essentially, both to our external enemies and potential internal enemies. But we also need to be viewed as savages, mongrels almost, so that our brothers may underestimate us, think us nothing more than brute force monsters. For whilst our public image is that of the Executioner's Axe, a symbol of deterrent and fear, we also need to be the silent and secret dagger in case we ever need to make good on our threats. And this, I think, is a very well done plot point, because it at once manages to maintain and honor the traditional image of the Space Wolves, keeping true to their lore and fluff, whilst also evolving them a bit, taking them in a slightly different direction, essentially presenting them as, yes, we are wild savages, but that is more to us than meets the eye, which is really cool, and it also shows instead of just merely telling you. Because the Space Wolves act both very savage, very tribal and very old-fashioned, and also quite sophisticated on occasion, which is really cool. I think perhaps it is still a little bit understated and some of the clear hypocrisies like how they don't quite view their magic as magic are still a little bit undercooked, but all in all, this is still a very well put together plot point. Anywho, with that I will wrap up the first part and judging by how far we've gotten, we might actually be able to get done in two or three parts this time. Wouldn't that be lovely? Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.